Um, if you like what you hear tonight, please do come and visit us. Um, also worth noting that the, the Battle Trust itself was very uh, helpful and instrumental in, in helping us get off the ground um, four years ago now. Uh, so um, it's great to be doing uh, something, collaborating with you again. Um, I think I will leave the introductions there and I will just crack on and share my screen with all of you. Bear with, there we go. Okay, so coal, salt and wagons. Um, been through, done that. We all know that there was a battle on the land between Preston Pans, Kackenzie and Trinent in 1745. Uh, this wasn't just any old part of the country. This was one of the biggest industrial heartlands in the whole of Scotland, responsible for producing 10% of all the sea salt in the country at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, and salt production needed an adequate supply of coal, another major industry which dominated the landscape and was in fact basically symbiotic with this with the salt industry one wouldn't have survived without the other um the, the muir at trinent was already dotted with the infrastructure associated with coal working which had been going on here for the last six centuries uh, so this was a non-urban area but it had the significant populace of industrial workers overseers managers and the communities and ancillary trades which supported these heavier industries uh, we'll come to who some of them were later, but let's first look at the landscape as we see it today. So many of you will be familiar of that, with that view, looking down the wagon way to the north, Kakenzie and Port Seaton in the distance. Now, this is where part of the battlefield is crossed by the wagon way. Um, and if you note at this point, the raised embankment, which the wagon way path is on, and it's significantly higher than the surrounding fields uh, where the, some of the movements and the, and the fighting of the battle took place. So if you hold that thought, and we'll come back to that later on, let's have a look at some of the trades which um, supported all the industries uh, and the communities of the area. So we're very lucky to have some great sources, but one in particular we'll come to later on. But much of the information about this project comes from this source. There, there's already been fantastic research done uh, by Professor Chris Watley, Jill Turnbull and others, um, which has been a great help as well to the Wagonway project and our research. Um, Smiths, of course, were vital, uh, with metalworking providing essential items to the whole community. In the early part of the 18th century, George Clark um, was operational and Peter Sibold, um, from Seton, um, we see one of the one of the varying spellings. He's he's noted as being from Sea Town, but it is the same place. Um, much of the work they were involved in uh, was in relation to horse tack, farming equipment, and salt pan infrastructure. Indeed, there's evidence to suggest that at some points the local smiths were employed solely on pan repair work for months at a time. Um, notoriously, the salt pans were. Um, uh, they were notorious for going out of action for um, and, and massive ruptures in the bottom of these iron pans where they boiled brine. Additionally, we have the Patterson family. Now, the Patterson family had been Smiths in Kikenzie since the latter part of the 17th century, with James Patterson Sr. being a Smith there at the time of the hearth tax in the 1690s. His son, George, uh, takes over the business by the 1740s, but was certainly involved before that, and is the smith at the time of the battle in 1745. William Dixon, a local right, this is our, uh, our amazing source, which we'll talk a bit more about later. He deals exclusively with George Patterson, um, who it seems is heavily engaged in producing a large quantity of nails, uh, which are bought for the use of William Dixon's work. Staying with the Patterson family, we have George's son, James, who was born in 1751, so shortly after the battle. 
Um, sadly, he was una unable to become the next Smith in the family line, as in 1762, he became the first known fatality on any railway in Scotland, as you can see on the screen there. Patterson James, son of George Patterson, Smith in Kikenzie, bruised by a wagon, died 27th, buried 28th of August, 1762, in the best child's mortcloth. Uh, so that's a, um, a shame for the Patterson family and um, recently brought back by the, uh, the Wagonway Heritage Group. Um, okay, so moving on to the glass industry. Now, many of people will be familiar with this image. This is the Ink Bottle House um, in Kikenzie, Port Seaton, just on the boundary between the two communities. Now, this is sadly demolished uh, in the 1930s, um, but our group recently took part in excavations around the site um, of this building. Um, not the site itself, but around it and, and discovered significant um, deposits of glassmaking activity. Uh, now, glassmaking was an industry which had a significant history in the area during the 18th century with manufacturers in both Morrison's Haven and the short-lived Port Seaton Glassworks that we can see here, um, which operated for around nine years in the 1720s and 30s. Uh, the Port Seaton venture was slightly shady, for want of a better term, as the York Buildings Company, uh, who had uh, owned, uh, owned um, the venture at Morrison Haven and many of the lands around, um, their own agents seem to have been involved in setting up this additional glassworks at Port Seaton, um, notably William Adam, William Adam in particular is a name which stands out. The Wagamay project, as I've said before, have conducted several excavations over the last few years, which have yielded examples of glass made at Port Seaton. They range from onion bottles and mallet bottles, fragments, uh, to glass wine stems, which you can see here in the picture. Indeed, set adverts in the Caledonian Mercury during and after the, port, the period of the Port Seaton glassworks indicate that the range and the volume of items made here was extensive. Uh, an advert from 1730 states that crown common or broad glass in all dimensions, all sorts of flint and crystal glasses, drinking glasses of all sorts, decanters, lamps, jelly glasses, mustard boxes, salvers and vials, glasses for alchemists, bell glasses for gardens, etc. Um, so goodness knows what etc means, but <laughs> after all that list, but um, they were certainly making a lot. It is also interesting to note that adverts for the same type of items left over from the original operation of the glassworks were still for sale in 1743, again advertised in the Caledonian Mercury. Additionally, we shouldn't ignore the hazards of life at this time, with incidents such as the, the glassworks coal sink being what, just one of the examples of dangers of ad hoc building practices in mining areas, uh, as we can see here from the, from the Gentleman's Magazine and was also reported in the Caledonian Mercury. Accidents and fires in June 1731, 21st of June, Edinburgh, three men fell into a coal pit at Port Seaton and were killed and the description at Kakeni, some of the houses belonging to the glassworks suddenly sunk down and the water rushing up, several of the servants perished. And the names of those servants were Parr and Whitson. So, all of these industries, glass, glass and the salt, which we'll get to in a moment, need a source of fuel, which of course is coal. Records of colliers are, themselves are rare, and being as they were at the bottom of the social ladder, little care seems to have been given to, for records uh, recording them at this time, although a very small number do appear in the Trenent Parish Mortality Book. But the landscape at the time, particularly around Trenent, is one dot is that what the is that is dotted with pits, sometimes with gin winding mechanisms mechanisms for raising the baskets of coal to the surface. The coal then being transferred to the wagonway 
the newfangled technology which was introduced here by the York Buildings Company in 1722. And you can see in the image there, uh, the cauldron mechanism uh, in the center and the wagon way at the left running down to the fourth. So Salters, uh, we have the names of many Salters from various records here. Um, there are 12 salt pans uh, at Kackenzie in the early to mid 18th century. This operation be originally being established by the Earl of Winton in 1630. Although it should be added that there's likely that this industry had been well established in the area before the formalization by the Earl. Prominent Salters included Robert Donaldson, William Dixon, John Brown, John Gregg, and David Balverde. John Gregg was, upon his death, succeeded, interestingly, by his wife, who is referred to as Widow Gregg in a number of texts. Uh, and it seems that she successfully carried on the operations of the salt pan. Uh, Chris Watley has conducted a huge volume of research into this community, in, including instances of misdemeanor. Robert Donaldson was jailed for two months for running salt. Um, an added misfortune for the poor man was that this was immediately after his wedding. So goodness knows what that did for the relationship. Uh, and in 1719, the Salters, all of them, having had Christmas off, declined to return to work uh, with various tactics uh, employed to entice them to return, including the refurbishment of the dog hole prison um, and a bonus for bringing in the first salt of the year. And they eventually returned in February of the following year. Uh, and if you see on the map behind, it's a bit grainy, but you can actually see the salt pans, little buildings with smoke coming out of the chimneys along the coast. Quite a lot of them all around Kakenzi. Uh, and there are a few further to the, to the west as well. Okay, so moving on from the Salters, merchants and other key players. This, this was a trading area. Um, we know that there's healthy trade around the ports with, uh, around the, the fourth with ports, um, trading with uh, all around the North Sea and the Baltic with uh, a, a Danish ship coming into Kikensi, specifically with uh, cargoes of timber on an annual basis, um, if not more, um, possibly bring it in from the Baltic. Uh, Thomas and John Maffey, uh, owners and lessees of Kakenzie House in the 1720s to the 1740s, uh, were trading in salt and many other goods at the time. Francis and William Grant come after the Maffeys, uh, and we know that Stephen Jolly um, and his brothers um, are trading out of Preston Pans at the same time. William Adam is kicking around in the area for a good long time um, and is involved with the York Buildings Company, as we've heard. Now, William Adam's brother, um, uh, brother-in-law, sorry, Archibald Robertson, um, these two are interesting because not only are they um, involved with the York Buildings Company, they actually hold the lease on the wagon way. Um, William Adam first, and then passing it on to Archibald Robertson um, through some dodgy dealings in the courts. So with all these people kicking around, they did need to entertain themselves. Um, so um, the Kikenzi Fair took place on the first Thursday of November every year, uh, with locals stocking up on winter supplies before the coldest months came along. Uh, there were even horse races, with the top prize being a new saddle of the finest quality, um, which presumably gave you an advantage in the race the following year. Now, the fair seems to have thrived in the 18th century, but um, it is noted in the first statistical account as being declining with the advent of shops. Um, so I think the the 18th century was the, the peak of it, and then it, it, it did seem to die away by the 19th century. Okay, 
Moving on to Kenzie House. As we see here in Andrew Hill's house is superb painting. Uh, most of you will be familiar with this part of the battle. The surrender of the government forces took place at Kenzie House. Uh, but at Kenzie House, this would have been undoubtedly a desirable place for the government forces uh, before their surrender. As we now know, there was a malt kiln and brewery in the grounds, not to mention a mill and a healthy water supply with a culvert to the sea, as noted in both sale adverts and the journals of our, of our key man, William Dixon, uh, in the 18th century. And I say he is key because William Dixon, um, a right work in Kikenzi. Beg your pardon. You're on the right screen now. Um, he wrote down all his jobs for a 25 year period, starting in 1720. Now, I'm sure all of you can do the maths, but that would take us to a very interesting year in the history of the Jacobite campaign. Uh, here he is busy writing down uh, his things in the diary or one of our reenactors kindly posed for this picture. And here's the first page of his book. Beg your pardon, my computer is doing something slightly odd here. Here we are, okay. Um, and already we can see that he writes well, albeit with some questionable spelling on occasions, notably that of his own name. I think we have uh, beg your pardon. There we are. Uh, we have William Dixon and We Alum Dixon uh, owns this book. Um, it is legible and it's well written. After all, if you're working for the York Buildings Company, they if they can't read your reckoning book, you aren't going to get paid. Uh, and Knowing the York Buildings Company, as I do after uh, various bits of research I've done, um, if they could get away with not paying you, that was exactly what they would do. Okay, so moving on. We're going to go have, have, a, have a wee journey with William Dixon um, and look at some of the extracts from his, his book. Uh, I should add that we're in the process of transcribing uh, his journals uh, cover to cover at the moment, which we will hope to publish next year. Um, so it's an ongoing bit of research. Uh, so we can see here on May the 13th, 1736, he is putting up two bulkheads in the two malt ships. Uh, so another link into the trades that he's working with. Um, in February the 9th, 1741, working at the kiln and the malt lofts. Um, and June the 10th, uh, working about Mr. Buell's house in Preston Pans. So he's getting around the area, and we know that he, he goes even further afield. Uh, he comes all the way up to Haddington and Pencaitland and across Aberdower to get timber um, and for, make, for making wheels for wagons and wondrous things like that. August the 11th, working in the malt loft again. So there's a, we're getting the impression here that there's, there's a, the malt industry um, is is thriving in Kikenzi, very important industry. And lastly, on this page, we have uh, December the 24th, no less, laying a back deal in the sloop. And a back deal is a type of uh, timber uh, planking that you have in the hold of a ship. Um, and so he's involved in boat building as well. And that's uh, something which uh, is, uh, an ever present throughout his journals. So also here in August the 11th, working in the malt loft. Oh, I think we've covered that already. Sorry, I beg your pardon, my screen share. Uh, October the last day, 1743, sawing oak timber for rails 
to Mr. Grant and Barrows. So this is an exciting one for us in the Wagamay project, uh, Mr. Grant being leaseholder at the time, and uh, he is making rails for the owner of the Wagamay, which is a nice bit of linkage. Um, April the 9th, 1744, working about salt works and making closed barrows. Um, and sawing oak timber on May the 28th and making a window to Henry Brown's house. Uh, so he's doing domestic stuff as well. So it really is a broad range of, of things that he is getting involved in. There we go. Apologies for the technological issues there. Um, okay, so we're into 1745 and we're getting quite close to, to, the, to the time of the battle. Uh, sawing at oak timber, uh, again, sawing deals. This is a type of uh, uh, unit of wood, uh, wood planking, uh, making um, pan rods for the works and making spouts for the same works. Now, this is referring to um, uh, long poles to, uh, for which were used for, with buckets on the end for scooping uh, scooping water out of the sea and spouts are a part of the uh, timber culverts and channels which through which the water was then run back into the pan house buildings uh, so he's at these involved in everything at the salt works and then working at the salt works again on February the 11th and annoyingly that's where his diary finishes. Uh, I, I, nothing has been quite as soul destroying as when I got to the last page of that book and find that it, it, it didn't say help the, the Jacobites are coming or something like that. But anyway, chance would be a fine thing. So what about the battle? Now, the wagon way itself, um, this is where we get into quite a, an interesting part of our research is that um, we, when we when we dug the wagon way in 2019, uh, you see the picture on the left there that um, our archaeologist at the bottom of the trench, he has come down upon uh, a cobbled surface. Um, and that it is at least a meter below the current level of the footpath. Now, what this tells us is that the uh, the level of the wagon way back then was radically different than it is today. And I think myself included, many people have looked at the, at the battle landscape and, and thought, um, how can this be with this big raised embankment? And the, the answer to that is that it's, it's relatively modern. How would troops have moved around the battlefield? Now, on the right, you can see a, a little model from our museum. Um, showing a, an approximation of, um, of what we found the hints of in the ground. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll just go in and show you a little bit of the detail of this. Uh, this sketch shows, is, shows a section of what we found in the ground. Now, uh, the, the area on the left is a cart track with wheel ruts. So not only did we have a wagonway crossing the battlefield at this point, there was also an existing cart track which predates the wagonway. Um, we have the wagonway itself in the center um, with a double rail, we think, um, and the cobbled surface overlaying with an ash and cinder covering. And in that ash and cinder covering, there was a uh, glass works waste, which had been used to make up that material. So a nice bit of dating evidence and linkage there. And then uh, to the east, we have a ditch um, and, and possibly a robbed out bank on the other side. Um, but these were not significant features there. The, the, the ditch is maybe half a meter deep at, at best. So there's our um, our feature running across the battlefield. Um, and what this looks like in, the, in real terms is, uh, here's, a, here's an interesting picture from 
reenactment a few years ago. Um, uh, myself in the middle and a couple of other reenactors. Uh, and we at this point we were reenacting, uh, uh, doing a little reenactment with our wagon that we with the path that runs through the middle of the battlefield. Actually, um, more closely resembles uh, the actual the, the original wagon way than we thought at the time. Um, so it looked something like this. A couple of wooden rails. Now you wouldn't see the sleepers because they were hidden beneath the surface. Now this is actually a quite a flush to the ground surface um, with a cinder path in the middle. And this one allows the horses that hold the empties back up the hill. It allowed them a comfy surface to walk on. But Bitten, remember that was overlain by cobbles. We have a ditch at one side. We possibly have a ditch at the other side. Um, and we have a cart track with wheel ruts that we found as well. So it starts to build up a picture of what this was like in the landscape. Now, tech issues again. Here we go. So when Jerry Embleton painted this fantastic painting all those years ago, um, he might not actually have been too far from the truth. Um, and when I first saw this painting, I thought, how on earth did he know that it was like that? <laughs> and then I did the archaeology, we did the archaeology in 2019. And, and actually what we found wasn't too different from this. Um, uh, just missing the cart track, etc. But you see the, the Jacobite there coming a cropper uh, as he didn't notice the, the wagon when he coming across the battlefield. And I think that that really is for me uh, the point about this because the the landscape at the time what was it like? It was a busy landscape. It was um, we had wagons coming up and down the hill. We had presumably people working in the fields around, um, and the towns were thriving. You know, all this was going on, and then suddenly. Um, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave the, the real insight into this to the battle historians, but suddenly you have this conflict taking place in the middle of this uh, actually uh, very busy landscape. Um, but the other thing I suppose for Aaron and his team to, to have a look at is the, what we found in the archaeology indicated that there, there wasn't a significant obstacle um, to uh, overcome um, during the route as they, as both sides move back towards the western side of the battlefield. So um, in, in essence, um, it, it strikes me that the absence of the wagonway on some of the, uh, some of the contemporary maps uh, isn't actually that much of a surprise, uh, given the fact it was probably a fairly um, insignificant um, feature in the landscape. Um, and uh, and bear in mind that the the, the operations of the wagonway actually stopped um, for a few days whilst all the, the troop movements uh, took place. Um, so, apologies for the tech issues again. There we go. What happened next? So, in the years after the battle, um, Thomas Matthew dies, and Francis Grant by this point has taken on um, industrial operations. Um, in 1747, Kikenzie House is up for sale. Again, Caledonian Mercury. Um, if you get the chance, have a look at the British newspaper archive. Um, they have uh, newspapers going back to 1700. Um, and it's an absolute gold mine of information. So Kikenzie House is up for sale in 1747, um, advertised by Francis Grant. Um, 1749, malt sales are continuing at Kikenzi. Um, there's a thriving malt industry still, and that has gone all the way through from 1720s right the way through. We know there's malt being produced um, here at this time. And in 1759, William Caddle, famous Caddle family, takes on Kikenzi and the operations there on a six-year lease. And eventually the Caddle family would, would come to own the wagonway and develop the salt and coal industries um, further, um, upgrading the wooden railway to an iron railway. So in essence, um, 
the, the answer to the question of what happened next was things basically got back to normal fairly quickly. Um, and there were clearly, there was clearly a lot of political stuff going on at the battle at the time, but the, in, these industries needed to get back up and running. And there was large, there were large communities that were brought to a standstill briefly by the, by the, um, the conflict. Um, and then essentially they picked up their tools and went again. Um, so what I will do is I will leave it there. That is, um, I could talk for hours on it. Um, there, there, if you want to know more about some of these characters, please do come down to the Wagonway Museum. As I said, we're open at the weekend, um, this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and we're open on Monday as well, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning till three in the afternoon. Um, our volunteers will uh, uh, give you the history of the Wagonway and more about some of these characters. So um, I will leave it there. I can take questions now because um, I'm sure I've posed more than I have answered already. Uh, so uh, I'm sure Aaron will facilitate questions for me and uh, yeah, fire away. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Ed. That's, I mean, that's a fascinating uh, insight into into the communities, and even um, you know, using using the the, the lens of, of uh, Dixon's journal to to look into um, those snapshots of of real people living living around the battlefield is is fascinating. Um, and uh, that, just picking up that point uh, myself that you, that you made at the end there about life returning to normal, uh, not long ago I was looking through the. Uh, the government's list of persons concerned in the late rebellion, uh, which uh, picks up a number of, uh, of local people um, that were accused of, of assisting the rebels. And when you look at it, it's, it simply basically says they continued in their jobs. And, uh, and because the, the, the salt duties were so lucrative, um, just continuing in your, <laughs> in your work um, uh, and helping to bring in those revenues um, uh, was, uh, was considered enough to, to be aiding and abetting the, uh, uh, the cause. But I think you do get a picture that uh, you know, people, people were pretty much carrying on. Unless you were directly uh, involved, the small numbers of people locally that we know uh, managed to work themselves into the Jacobite army, even if uh, just for the next few months, um, and, and others who obviously would have had uh, people uh, people, uh, wounded soldiers that we know were, were lying in some of the local houses for, for days and weeks after the battle. But as you say, other than that, uh, people uh, uh, have too much at stake to, uh, to, to let the battle uh, interfere with their lives for too long. So anybody who, who has any questions, please pop them into the uh, Q&A box or, or into the chat box, and I'll try and, and spot them on both. Uh, we've had a, a question from, from Adrian, uh, uh, and, uh, and he, he says, do you think that the Wagon Way had any influence over the, the, the speed of, of events at the battle? Um, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I, drawing back onto the kind of the, the, its place in the landscape, I do think that um, the fact it was it, rather than this raised embankment that it had that there was today, certainly that an embankment the size that there is today would have um, been a significant obstacle on the battlefield. Um, and we, Aaron and I, we've talked about this before. Um, but the, it, it's, it was pleasing to find in the archaeology that the um, the, the landscape was actually a much flatter landscape because it backed up the kind of contemporary accounts I think that um, of, of the battle and the way the way movements around the battlefield um, help but maybe Aaron you can um, elaborate on the on, on, on the movements up and down the wagon way um, <laughs> yeah I, I mean I think I, I think you're bang on Ed I think the um, for a long time uh, you and I and others had wondered why the wagon way, which is such a significant route through the landscape today, uh, doesn't get mentioned in the eyewitness testimony of the, of the battle particularly. And some of the contemporary plans don't put it in either, although others, others do. Um, so, so how was this not a feature that seems to have been noticed by people when they were, um, uh, admittedly, they had other things on their mind, but uh, they, uh, it just didn't seem to be a feature that registered to them significantly. And I think the the work that uh, that your group has done has, has started to help us understand that 
in that it was a, a, a permeable barrier from from east to east to west, um, uh, and and that's that's really significant. As you as you also say, however, uh, it does make it important. It does become an important landscape feature in the northwest traffic um, up and down through the battlefield. Those of you who are familiar with the, the field will know that there was a, a large boggy area that stretched right from Seaton Village in the east through towards Bankton in, in the west uh, and, if, and effectively cut the two armies off on the day before the battle. And that, uh, and that cart track uh, and, and wagonway um, pairing running across straight through the middle of that ground um, is a really significant um, dry crossing point, therefore. And... I'm almost certain, and as we've discussed before, Ed, that that is the route that the Jacobite officers' horses are brought down onto the battlefield from um, from the Kerala at Trinent Churchyard, because it is the quickest access point from uh, from the south side of the field onto the onto the heart of the battlefield, um, and uh, and and it might well have been the route. It almost certainly is the route that the cart carried Colonel James Gardner up to Trinent Church after his servant found him mortally wounded on the field. So, so the wagon way does play a role in how, um, in how people move around the battlefield, but it's that northwest um, uh, um, uh, transfer rather than the, the east-west um, uh, barrier that we, that we talked about previously. Um, uh, a question from, from Gordon, he says, um, how long did the cattles stay with the salt industry at Kikenzie? Um, I believe um, that they, they were active there until the latter part of the 19th century, um, certainly by uh, 1875, it is in the hands um, of another gentleman, I can't remember now, the name of now, but um, certainly the, the cattles have the salt industry at Kikenzie in, in the 1850s and by the 1870s it is over to to, to others. Um, uh, so that's um, probably the most, although it's not the most accurate answer, I'd like to give at this stage, it's uh, it's uh, it's there or thereabouts. I think, I suspect the 18, 1860s is is, uh, is where it kind of, uh, it starts to fizzle out for the cattles um, as the, uh, the coal by this point is going, uh, is, is um, there's a slightly different market for the coal and it, it's, it's being transferred onto the newly built North British Railway at Meadow Mill rather than coming all the way down uh, to Kikenzie. Um, so they're able to get it onto the main line. And there's, I think there's even some fantastic photos um, of the coal depot um, near to where Waverley Station is now um, with, um, with wagons saying Trinent Colliery on them. Um, uh, nice old photos from the 19th century. Uh, so there we go, yeah. That's great, thanks Ed. Uh, Tim, Tim is asking us, um, uh, was, the, was the wagon way primarily to feed the salt industry um, or was it also uh, exporting and supplying to the capital? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, initially, I think I've almost answered that question with the last answer, but initially it was it was solely for the salt industry. Um, and even um, at the end of the 19th century, there is an Austrian chap, Dr. Svediar, who's active in the area at the time in both Preston Pans and in Port Seaton. Um, and his, his salt pan at Port Seaton is poorly placed. Um, he doesn't have an, uh, his own supply of coal and he complains bitterly that um, his competitors, who are at that point um, are the Caddles, have an internal supply of coal, which he can't compete with. Um, so certainly, initially, the, the coal is coming down for the salt and salt only, although, um, as I referred to in the last answer, uh, by the 19th century, there is, there is then a means, and there's probably in the cities, um, I think people are burning coal in their fires and things in the cities by this point, and there's a market for it there. Um, but certainly coal did go out um, in the 19th century from Kikenzie Harbour, um, as we've, we've also excavated areas there, which reveal the coal tipping mechanism um, for loading coal onto the waiting ships. Um, 
And the understanding of that is that the good coal got shipped out and the poor coal was burned in the salt pans. Um, and there's a potential for that to have happened earlier, but we, uh, it's, it's um, circumstantial or sort of hearsay evidence at the moment that the, um, we've yet to track down the ship, the, the actual um, bills of lading for Kikenzi at this, uh, in the early, early days. Um, but no doubt there will, there will be coal export there as well. But um, primarily the, rail, the railway was built by the York Buildings Company in order to bring coal for the salt pans. Just, just following on from that, Eddie, if it, I mean, it, I, th I find this difficult to get my head around sometimes. So, I mean, can, can we get any indication in terms of talking about mid 18th century, early to mid 18th century, just the, the scale of that uh, of that industry at, um, at Kikensi, the, the amounts of coal that would have been required to feed that uh, that panning industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, 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 uh, as a, a ballpark figure, you needed roughly 18 times the volume of coal uh, to produce a single uh, unit of salt. Um, so if you had if you had 18 tons of coal, you might get one ton of salt back if you did it really well. Um, so it's not <laughs> for the amount of effort you have to put in. Um, it doesn't yield that much salt. But um, bear in mind that a, a lot of these uh, workers back then were, or, or vast majority of them were, in theory, under serfdom. Although, the, 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 as I referred to before, the kind of uh, the ability for, for them to wield their their ability to strike, as it were, on mass, um, you know, questions that um, the black and whiteness of serfdom really. But um, but certainly it it was uh, I think in certainly in the early days of or, or the early days of the wagon way, um, the volumes of coal to salt. Um, you probably had to virtually enslave people to actually do the work because it's so heavy and so it, it wasn't much better than being dead in the mines, but probably marginally. Mm -hmm. Donald's asking if you've had a look at the horse-drawn wagon way from Holbeath to St David's Bay on the on the Fife side, uh, whether there are any similarities uh, over there. Um, yeah, so the Fordale Railway. Um, now. There's not a lot of it left to see, although I think there are there's, there's some people I was in touch with recently are, um, are doing a bit of exploring and they've found one or two remnants. Um, the, as far as I understand it, that was a, a, a standard gauge line. Uh, um, this, the differences being that the Fordell Railway was a bit later. So it started off with better technology from the beginning. Um, uh, and the, the wagons were a lot bigger um, and, and uh, they could carry heavier loads. And it's, the whole operation was a lot more high tech, as it were. Um, and I think it's interesting that the, the early, the, the early um, date of our wagonway here, um, I'm not sure this wagonway ever really... Um, Got to the level of some some of the some of the railways that came in later started with a sort of advantage that they came in with better technology, whereas our one started as a wooden railway which lasted for a hundred years before it was then replaced by uh, an iron an iron wagonway and um, uh, and interestingly the iron wagonway was a, a narrower gauge than the than the earlier wooden wagonway. It went from four foot six down to uh, three foot three. Um, so I think it maybe says something about the the time they were doing that and the volume of um, coal that they that they wanted to bring down to Kikenzi Harbour, or the fact that or that they could um, feasibly export from Kikenzi Harbour if they were, or you know, it, the size of the operation was potentially limiting by that point. Mm. Um, but certainly the Fordell Railway is an interesting one. Some cracking photographs of. I think on eBay you can put there's a every so often there's a little nice little book that was produced about 50 years ago with loads of lovely photographs of Ford Elmer. Really, so look that one out. And uh, and Ross is asking about the relationship between uh, Kikenzi House and and the Wagon Way at this time. Yeah, essentially in, in the 18th century, the, the house um, when when the York Buildings Company um, acquired the estate, um, or the Winton Estate after the the 1715 rising. Um, uh, they acquired it in 1719 um, and essentially 
the coal and the salt um, operations and the house all came as a, as a package at that point, um, along with the rest of the estate. Um, so, so essentially, that if you if you were operating the coal and the salt works, you probably lived in the house, um, uh, and and the, the references to the, the the merchants that were Mathy and um, and Grant through the middle of the 18th century, um, they they certainly have the house and they certainly operate the the coal and the salt works. So we're we're, we're fairly safe on that ground there. Uh, it gets a wee bit complicated later on. Um, when the when the York Buildings Company is dissolved in 1777, and then the, by 1779, all these different parcels of land are and and assets such as the house are divvied up into smaller um, parcels. Um, so, um, and and even to the to the point where some of them some of them were tailored to the people that they wanted to to get them. Um, so one of them was one part, part, particular parcel land was referred to as Caddle's Lot, um, and that included the Kikenzie House and, and uh, the Wagonway, etc. So, um, yeah, there's um, it's been through various um, uh, incarnations of, and, and, and it's gone along with various parcels of land. And essentially, the further through time we went, um, the more it got broken down um, until the, the industries eventually fizzle out. That's that's fantastic. Thanks, Ed. Um, no, I think that's uh, that's pretty much covered most of the of the questions. Uh, the um, for those of you who who aren't familiar with the uh, with with the landscape directly, you, there is uh, uh, an app, a free downloadable app that allows you to explore the battlefield and the the la the line of the wagonway, uh, which is preserved essentially as a as a, as a footpath uh, running straight through um, roughly north south through the battlefield. Um, and, and both of those uh, walking trails are available on the app, which you can find on our, um, our website. And, uh, and of course, at the, at the end of the Wagonway, at the north end of the Wagonway, you'll, uh, you'll find the uh, Wagonway Museum, as, as, as Ed um, explained earlier. Uh, and uh, and you can uh, if you've got once you've got your eye in you can find some of that evidence of the wagon way in the harbour that uh, that Ed and his team have, have exposed. Do you have any uh, uh, plans? I know things have been uh, thrown off uh, over the last year, uh, but do you have any uh, current plans for future archaeological works on the wagon way, Ed? Um, things are in the pipeline. I can't reveal too much yet. Um, we we had intended, for a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> we had intended to go back um, uh, back to the, the same spot. The, the excavations we did in, tw in 2019, we discovered the original uh, surface of the horse track, and there were in in the, in the sections there as well. There were um, the, the 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 hints of decayed rails and things like that. Um, but that was only a one meter wide trench spanning the width of the of the wagonway path. Um, our intention had been to go back in there last year, um, and um, that was obviously, uh, you know, pandemics happened and all the rest of it. So um, we, we we still intend to go back to to, to do that work at some point, and, th and that work will be to open up a longer stretch of it to to get a better understanding of the construction and see if it can be compared to um, similar. Um, similar railways um, which have been excavated in the north of England, for example, uh, Willington Quay. Um, so, th so that work is in the pipeline. Uh, we hope it'll happen later this year. Um, and we also have our archaeology that we, we are going to complete uh, on the salt pan building um, just on the on the shore at, uh, behind the old Kirk at Kenzie. Um, and that is uh, part of the, that's funded by the salt of the earth. Heritage Connections um, uh, project, which is ongoing. Uh, so yeah, we've got various plans this year, and um, uh, yeah, we're, we're very much looking forward to them. And hope, fingers crossed, that we're still allowed to do everything by the time that we're planning these. So uh, absolutely. What's and of course, the most important question uh, is: uh, Will uh, people be able to see your replica wagon on our replica battlefield uh, for the reenactment weekend in September? Yes. <laughs> um, we wouldn't miss it. We wouldn't miss it for the world. We'll um, we'll, we'll have we'll have a, a small team of um, civilian reenactors and uh, you know riding in the camp on a wagon. Um, it's, it's, and it's, 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 
yeah. <laughs> it's a great symbol of that interplay between the the industrial landscape and 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 the battle and the and the the fact that uh, you guys are uh, and your enthusiasm um, and your 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 replica um, uh, just uh, help to, to to bring that point to life at the reenactments is uh, is fantastic. Well, before I uh, let you all uh, go this evening, uh, I want to say a, bit, a big thank you to to Ed for giving up his uh, his Thursday night uh, to join us. Uh, I think everyone uh, here would agree that it's provided a, a fantastic and detailed uh, insight into uh, into the industrious community that we have on that, especially on that north side of the battlefield. Uh, for the uh, last presentation of our, our spring series, I'm afraid uh, you're stuck uh, with me, uh, and that is on Thursday the 20th of May, again at 8pm, uh, and that is a, uh, uh, an exploration around the battlefield landscape um, through photographs, uh, and uh, we'll look at the events of the battle itself. Um, and uh, and the uh, the details of, of what happened uh, where uh, so some of what we've been talking about tonight will be will be great uh, preparation for that uh, again uh, it's free it'll be available on zoom and we will um, uh, hopefully be able to live stream it uh, somewhere uh, if not to Facebook if we can't resolve the problems we've had tonight then uh, again like we've done this evening we'll live stream it onto onto YouTube so um, but hopefully many of you will join us here uh, on zoom where we're able to to, to have the the conversation uh, and uh, uh, and also I should draw your attention to the fact that um, as of today uh, our uh, first public exhibition uh, of the year has been able to open the Battle of Preston Pan's Tapestry. Uh, this is uh, for the, any of you who are uh, up in the northeast of Scotland particularly uh, because that exhibition only a year or so late has finally opened at the Geary Heritage Centre in, in Inverurie. Inverurie, of course, being the site of another Jacobite success in 1745, uh, hence uh, our, our visit to, to that community. So the Preston Pants Tapestry is on display there now uh, uh, until the um, uh, 6th of August. Uh, and uh, I should also add uh, that if any of you uh, are, are feeling inclined, if you've been enjoying the, the, the online uh, presentations we've been offering you, uh, then you can go to our website, uh, battleofprestonpan1745.org forward slash support uh, and see the ways that you're able to, to donate or, or contribute or, or assist us uh, in continuing our work uh, at Preston Pan's Battlefield. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, a big thank you to, to Ed Bethune, uh, from the 1722 Wagon Way for joining us. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening, and I hope I'll see many of you again uh, on the 20th of May. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>